you have to as well. So an easy way to do this, uh, and I will delete everything which is on this slide and I'll show you from scratch. So essentially you have the homework here uh, in a table. Uh, are you interested to talk about the problem one or problem two? Both, okay, good. Okay, so we basically we have, uh, we're copying over that table. We have now uh, our three exams, we have semester and sex. So now the easiest way to approach this, and this is not the proper way. Uh, so I gotta make this point that it's not the nicest way to do that. But what you really want to do, you want to keep that alignment of gender and the exam score. Easiest way to do that, and it's not it's not proper that way. So please don't uh, say that I've showed you to do that. But the easiest way is redundancy. You basically you're just copying these columns over, and you replicate these two columns before each exam score. Therefore, you're preserving the alignment between the score and your set. And if you do this again, you basically you have now this alignment for all three exams. What you can do now, and this is the beauty of it. You said this is what not to do that? Hmm? You said this is like what we shouldn't do. No, you, no, for this for this homework, you can do that because it's the easiest way to do that. And to solve the problem. Well, you, do you, you copy A and B and you insert it before exam two, this course, because they are, thereby you're aligning your biological sex entry with your score entry. Yeah, but I have to redundancy something. I think that's no, no, that, that is no redundancy, meaning that you just you, you copy it, you, you replicate the cells, thereby you basically get three, three blocks that are identical. So you have semester sex, exam one, semester sex, exam two, semester sex, exam three. That just makes it easier for you to handle the data for now. It's not, it's, not, it's not a clean approach and it's not, but for now solving that problem at hand, it's the easiest approach to do that, yes. Mm -hmm. The homework. Homework. <laughs> uh, did you see the homework posted? Oh, okay. Yes, yes, sir. Uh, was there another question? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now we have replicated semester and sex. Uh, and now essentially what we can do now, we're selecting A to C, and now we can treat this independently. So we're, we're, we're treating exam one first, then we do two, then we do the three. So we're selecting A to C, we go and sort. And this is where we're making things now a little easier for us because we're pre-processing this data in some shape or form that makes it easier to complete the assignment. So if we sort by, we're clicking on column and we're sorting it by sex. It basically will sort it by sex. It will have females first and then males. If you do it, we're doing this for exam one, uh, columns A to C. We're selecting A to C. Uh, this is up to you. It's up to you, how, however. Well, A to C or C to A. So male comes in the alphabet after female, if you want male first. And so that's pretty much what it is. So it really is up to you. The only thing that is important that you block it together and you're treating them uh, separated by male. Because what you do next you have on the left lower corner of that data sorting field, you have uh, a plus sign. This plus sign essentially allows you to add a second level of sorting. This plus sign allows you to sort by the second level. So you can first sort your data by biological sex, and then 
second line, you, uh, uh, on the second level, you sort it by exam scores, which is exam one for uh, columns A to C. So if I do okay now, I basically have sorted this by gender, uh, by, by sex, and by scores. So that makes your exercise already tremendously easier, right? Because now the only thing you need to do is you count the number of entries. You do the same exercise here for exam two. You go again on sort, you sort it by sex, take the plus, and you sort it by score. Same exercise you do for exam three. Hmm? Uh, it's it's just labeled exam one, two, and three. It's not labeled score. You could rename it. Yeah. Or sort this data, the data tab. So you do copy by sex, and then second level you sort by exam score. Good. Hmm? No, because then it changes the learning. Right? You you want to preserve. That alignment. You, if, if, if you sort it by this and this and this, you sort it, it doesn't really preserve that. So you, this this is this is the problem, right? That's it that you're dealing with. Yes. Then you did probably different sorting. So if you copied the right uh, exercise from the word document, you uh, should have the same number. So now next, you basically you build up the table and the table asks for count proportions, percentages, averages, standard deviations for different groups. So now you have exam one for the overall category. So now you have the groups first. So groups is uh, 40, 41 to 50, then you have 50 to no, 51 to 60. 61 to 70 and then so on and so on. Good. Now you want first you want the count, then you want the proportion. Oh, that's that's easy. You just select the entire thing. Uh, you make uh, control A or you you click on the left upper corner. You go on format cells. And you go on uh, was it border, border, yes, correct. You click none and you take off here all borders. So now it's gone. In formulas or in format? No format, format cells. So again, left upper corner, right click, format cells, border. There you take the preset of none. Hmm? Yeah, show me later. It, it should be there. Show me, show me after that. Um, it should be there. Good. Okay, so now we have count. And count, there are a couple of, so now we have this sorted, right? So counting is easy now. So basically, you count either men and women, or you count, uh, or you count. Uh, just men, just women. Both is possible. Another way is you can do it with a formula that is count ifs. Ifs. So you remember how we did with the volcanoes? We did count if, we did count. So count ifs basically is a formula that allows you to define criteria for counting. So if you're being asked for the overall codes to do that, you just write count ifs, you open a parenthesis, and then you click on uh, here to the left, you have that little fx. This fx opens up the formula builder. And in the formula builder, the only thing you need to do, you select the range first, which is here C2 to C30, so all the way down. So that's the range. And if you click on that plus below your formula builder, it asks different criteria. 
And you have two criteria. Criteria. The criteria is that it's greater than 50, it's smaller than 60. What? Uh, so basically, you're just selecting whatever range you want to select. So you have to write count ifs. Open brackets, so that you can get here on the FX. This is FX. The highlight. Uh, yes. But when you go in that cell where you want to write that, which is essentially your first count field. So once you click the FX, you open the formula builder, which you see here. Then you define on the first text field, you define the range, which is C2 to C30. The criterion here is a quotation mark greater than 50. Then you click again the plus, and then you can enter the second criteria. So the second criterion is now again the range C2 to C3. Wait, that? greater than 50. That's it. Uh, then you open up uh, the second criteria range. So you, you can enter two criteria. Why is it greater than 50? Because we are in, in the group. Oh no, we are. So if we do, okay. Okay, so here we want the grouping, right? Yeah. So we have 51 to 60. I was in the wrong cell, right? <laughs> Count ifs. So then now fx. So now we have c2 to c30. Now we have criterion. This is now greater than oh, 50. Correct, yeah. Quotation marks. Yes. Uh, can you just write it, right? Equal sign count yeah. ifs and the parenthesis open. Yeah. And then if you click on the F, it gets there in the front. I just do it. That's all. Okay, but this is fine. It should, it should give you a count ifs. If you do it in office 365, you don't have to call me in the field of the Illinois reason. Yeah, it's the same as the problem with us here. So you don't have to formal the bill. I, I wasn't aware of that. So if you're in Office 365 or you have an order version. Hmm? Yes, yes, yes. But if you have a, an older version or you're in Office 365, then you don't have to form a builder. So the way you have to approach this, so you I'm have to do this. No, no, you're doing the same thing. Okay. So you basically you have it here mapped out. So you have here uh, count ifs. We need to do it here in the actual formula. So we have criteria range one. Yeah, comma which is C2 to C30, right? Yeah. Comma, yeah. criteria one, which is greater no. than 50. No, no. Quotation no. mark. Also with quotation mark. Comma, quotation mark, greater than 50. So with quotation mark closed. Comma. Oh, then I see. Then another comma. And it basically tells you uh, whatever popped up below. So let's kill the formula builder. We're not doing this. Equals count ifs. We have C2 to C30, comma, greater than 50, quotation mark closed, comma, range criteria two is again C2 to C30, comma, 
a criterion is smaller than 61. Or smaller equal to 60. Okay. What do you get? You get now the count of all entries uh, for exam one overall, irrespective of biological sex, uh, that is between 50 and 60. Why is it? In the front, yeah, that is less than equal to 60. Yeah. Why? Because it's 51 to 60. It's so the definition of the category. So I'm saying, why is it just less than 60? Uh, because then it's 59. Yeah. So when you, when you plug that in, what do you yeah. get? Yeah, I get five. So if you open if you open up an equal sign and you write count ifs parentheses, nothing changes. Wait, count yeah. Yeah, you sort the difference. That's fine. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, it depends on how you sort that. Right? But the count should be consistent. So this should be written. Yep, that's what that says for that. Equal sign count is C2 to C30, comma, greater than 50. Yes. Well, but you have too many arguments. I don't know. Uh, did you write exactly that? Now, that was the next step. That was the count. 
That's an interesting problem. Does anybody uh, does anybody have a problem that it gives a zero regardless of what formula you enter? That I've never seen before. Who who else is working in Office three sixty five? Yeah. Yeah, but it works. That is that is even more surprising. Um, but based on what I've just seen here, uh, so I will, um, I'll post uh, an extra spreadsheet as an announcement. Can you download it and upload it manually? That should ramify the problem. So I'm gonna create an Excel spreadsheet because it seems to be a problem with copy. In Word. I, I have no explanation, I've never seen it. They did work. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have never come across a problem like that. Uh, I'm usually good at fixing problems, but that one I really don't know how to fix. Um, 
Is there a way that like your address can be different than your Twitch feed? Yes, that's the idea. So how can I do that? Like all of a sudden, like how am I going to get all the creators that's going to be added? No, it's not that easy. You need to do it by hand for each of the categories, unfortunately. Um, oh, so I can't drive. Good call. Just a second, I'm with you in a second. Okay, I'm posting it as an announcement. You can download it now as an announcement. Okay, so uh, what what other questions? You have another question? Yeah. Um, how, also, I also want to go with the other one. So, how are we, if we can do this process right now, how are we to know which is the same as if the end? Like, I'm just nervous that there's going to be other questions. But they, they, they just put it, right? Yeah, but I'm just nervous that there's going to be other questions and other things that they are not. Yeah, but we can't do homework is for definition. We don't know how to do everything else. Yes, we get the average, we get the standard deviations. We just need to follow the outcome. Any other questions? Uh, is there more to it? I'm open to it. It's the homework. Hmm? All right, uh, any other questions? All right, good. Okay, so then homework. Problem two is a little bit different in nature. Uh, what, you, what you asked for in homework problem two is uh, you're supposed to uh, utilize the data set that is given here in pretty much the same fashion. So we, that's the only thing we did so far. We did uh, frequency tables and we did uh, averages. That's, that's all that's needed. So yes, please. Well, given that it's smaller, yes, uh, count it in either or, and uh, formally you would round up with 50.5, you would round to 51. Yeah. So I would, I personally, if I were asked, I would count it in the upper group, but it's not formally there. Form, yes. I would look at the function, right, if the function is sensitive, it's fine. Yes. Also, uh, on the first problem, uh, what should I do for all men and for all women? It should be in two separate categories. Like separate um, tables or something? Yes. So, so it's, 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 it's going, overall. that was just overall. So you basically, I suggest Keep to do it. exam overall. Uh, overall you basically, I would structure it like that. I would do average, I would do uh, then uh, SSD. Then I would do here man. And I would basically uh, this. Over. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I would basically replicate it like this and uh, put it in the format of one table. And you did this for exam one, and then exam two. So for exam one, two, and three, you do all the measurements. Yes. 
Let's for example two. Then for example three. It's not difficult, it's just annoying. All right, any other questions to problem one? Otherwise, let's quickly look at problem two. Um, what's in the instructions? Excuse me? Well, uh, you have the lecture recording to review. Okay, uh, so this is basically uh, the same concept here. Um, you're basically doing again a grouped frequency tables. So you have again the same ranges and you need to uh, again read the ranges here from that table. So it's the same outline, it's the same principle. So you do again uh, proportions, percentages, age entries, you do, I've given you permission to use the function, so you can do it with the average function, the standard diff and the stdef.p function. Uh, please make sure you take the dot p function because I explicitly said it. You don't use the normal standard deviation function. Yes. That depends on the group you're looking at. So if you do it for, for uh, men and females, uh, the sample size is essentially the, 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 the women in there. And for men, it would be, the denominator would be the man in there. If you do it for overall, then the denominator is the overall group, men and women. The numerator is the number of entries that you're looking at. So if, if this is a count in a group, that's uh, those that we have counted. Nominator would be the overall group number. So it's it is for the men, for the women, for the men, and women, depending on what you're analyzing. And you're saying about like your like the percentage of employees, which number is the same as men, which number is the employees? Uh, you have groups, right? You have different groups. If you have five for overall, then you have the proportion would be five divided by the number of all entries. Right? So that's uh, C2 to C3, so that's 28 entries. That's five divided by 28. If you want to have a proportion for women, you take that respective count, which is two, 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 three, then it's two divided by the number of women. Okay. It's P8. P8 is the cell. Okay. Uh, I don't know where you get to from. You well, not the name. You said I said P8. P8 is that one. If I have a count here for men, I take this, this, this two by the calculation of the proportion, I take this number for the count, and I divide it by the number of men. That's how I calculate the percentage of the population. Maybe, yeah. So we're taking a proportion, how is Oh, yes. So I said proportion and percentages. I think that's what the question asked for, right? For men, would it not be always different? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Let's get to the problem too, because we need to move on to the material now. Well, we, did, we, we did the volcanoes. Remember the volcanoes? The volcanoes? It's the same concept that we're using here. So you basically, you find a group and you count the number of entries within the group. Okay. So we did the volcano example where we built frequency tables. It's nothing else but the frequency table that we did. Correct. So you have here or you have here men, you have here women. So you're just repeating it for each of those groups. So if we do all this, then we have an answer. So if we fix that physical chart as A cell. For exam one, one, yeah. Then you need to do exam two and yeah, exam three. If we plot the chart for all of them, then like I don't have anything to do with it. So there's, there's no question in there, right? It asked for a bar chart for the overall, uh, but that's easily done. Um, and then for the bar chart, we have to make an overall statistic of all the exams. Yeah. So it's not just the, for, for, for the overall counts within the exam. Also, what's camp? What's camp? What's camp? Count? Uh, What's the number, number of entries? Count? Yeah. If you count the certain number of entries, you get to a count. So it's, it's, the, the noun, it's the noun of the word counting. Yeah? How we total entries? Yes. Yeah. P8 is, it, is five for you? Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I have zero. Oh, this here? Oh, I didn't complete this yet. Um, um, I, I didn't really amend this uh, formula. Uh, this is F, F2 to F3. This, this is count this. This? You have two. I have two, two. Uh, then you're in C, then you're in exam one. Exam one is five. Exam two should be two. Yes. Uh, it could be that you have the same problem as uh, your colleague Esther. As Esther. Sorry for that. Uh, I'm getting there. Uh, that you will need to load the Excel spreadsheet uh, that I have just posted as an announcement because there's an office hiccup. Was the office 365 from you? Why are you? Hmm? I hope not. Uh, you can always make, well, I, I don't know. Right? Is, uh, this is a problem I've never seen. It seems to be something that is specific to office 365. But it's just the problem is just with the count ifs function, right? Can you uh, build a sum of uh, all the scores that occur? Yeah. yeah. So does it count? Does it actually use the actual value? Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm afraid you will need to upload this Excel spreadsheet. Uh, I, I don't know why that happens, uh, but it happens with the copying from a Word document. Yeah. It should be on. Should be on. Yes. Oh. Uh, 
hold on, I need to post it first. Now it's open. Okay, uh, what was your question again? Sorry. On the two. Problem two or? This here. F13 to F13. Would actually be F, F2, not F13. F to the F, uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's still to the Do you have this order that we're quoting? Right? Uh, there was a question. Uh, yes. But you have this order that so recording. You need to revisit this at home, anyways. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this requires a little bit of uh, troubleshooting there. Okay, so we. Yeah, I can't answer this question. Right now. Yeah, I can't answer this question right now. We can look at it after. Okay, uh, I need to carry on now. Uh, so you have the lecture recording. I can quickly go over uh, problem two. Problem two has the same kind of uh, uh, scenario where you're basically being asked to uh, create a frequency table with time groups that are given here, where you have ranges of time. You build the same form of table with the same groupings and you again calculate um, proportions of uh, that fall into this respective category. Uh, you have uh, employees in each group and you have them age entries and you use this age entries as a continuous variable to calculate uh, age, mean age and standard deviation. Since you're using formula, please make sure that you use stdef.p. If you don't do it, I take points. Uh, present all numbers from A to, uh, A to B in a separate table. That means you're gonna separate it into a separate table. Wait, I'm sorry, what was it that we should do? stdef.p. It's an electric recording from last class. Yeah, dot p. For standard deviation. For standard deviation. Uh, okay, then you develop a scatter plot, which we've done in uh, chapter three. Uh, and then I want you to draw inferences out of the trends that you see in that scatter plot. All right. Good. So this was the homework. You have this all as a recording. I just confirmed this recording. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about sampling and probability. And that's a very important topic essentially because this is uh, basically all that research is evolving around. So you basically you want to calculate, uh, you want to do research in samples because you can't study an entire population. So you basically, you study a sample that is accessible to you to study. In a perfect world setting, you would have a random sample where basically everybody in that population also is being represented in that sample that you're studying. So basically the distribution is identical between sample and population. This is unfortunately not always the case. To be honest, it's almost never the case because most uh, studies are basically conducted in populations that, uh, so you're basically you're studying a convenient sample, a sample that is accessible to you that is not representative to the population you're actually going to use that insight on. Uh, best example of blood pressure medications, for example, that are studied in populations that are accessible, but basically have been used in an older population that basically you couldn't even study in the first phase or in early phase studies. So this is one of the problems essentially because you, you're kind of uh, limited to convenient samples that are accessible to you, that are Worst case scenario is readily available, such as a college student, right? Uh, it's particularly with social sciences, when you uh, look at the surveys, it's very hard to convince people to actually participate in your study and fill out the 150 item questionnaire 
which takes an extra minutes to fill out. This is very hard to uh, actually obtain such data from the corporation at the interest. College students tend to have more time for such things uh, and uh, use sort of psychology. We will do a lot of surveys uh, on campus, for example, as if you know or if you don't know the people that want to help you, the research service. So they basically will fill out those questionnaires, but then you want to extrapolate it to the entire population. This would not be possible. So, uh, so perfect world scenario, random sample, unfortunately, most cases, convenient samples. It's also true with a lot of surveys, for example, when you stand in the supermarket, you will get a different opinion about, I don't know, the economic situation of the US when you stand next to a fancy clothing store as opposed to stand next to, I don't know, GameStop. <laughs> this is the same. So you get different opinions and you get different insights based on that sample. And this may not rep be representative of uh, the overall population. So random sample, every member of the population has equal chance to select typically a study, almost never used, and for practical reasons, they won't be used. And it's difficult to access an entire population, which would be the perfect worst. That would be more perfect than a random sample, would be study the entire population, but that's obviously absolutely not possible. Convenient samples are those that are readily available, and it's really, it's, it's out of practicality because you can't study the, the random samples. So the problem with convenient samples are that they represent a large population. And this essentially is uh, reflected in the absence or the lack of generalizability. Generalizability was synonymous with also labeled external validity. Is essentially what is describing the representativeness of the population by the sample population by the sample that we have studied. And uh, this essentially you can formally test. So there are ways how to compare, for example, your sample mean to a population mean. And this is actually what we're going to start off with hypothesis testing with a uh, so called set test where we will compare sample means to population means. So this will be the first, uh, first data steps that we're going to take with hypothesis testing. And yeah, so limited external validity and validity makes uh, in makes makes your insights and the appearance is somewhat problematic. The way you would essentially overcome this limitation is by replication. That means that the same study that you have conducted in hundred individuals in New York needs to be also done in Minnesota, Japan, Singapore, and Europe, and you basically you try to get more studies. That studied the same outcome in comparable populations in different settings, and thereby, if you get the same insight over and over for all those studies, you basically you find your initial insight confirmed, and thereby you get the sample confirmed. Okay, so I've seen this now in, in several different samples, so now it seems like this is something we can safely extrapolate to the population. So that's why replication is essentially. Uh, one way to overcome. Uh, of note, uh, we will also talk about so called meta analysis. So, when you, for example, when you compare uh, two arms in a randomized study, you get a so called difference between those arms. So, this difference essentially can be formally compared if you have this from several studies. You can uh, use certain analytic procedures to look at this in a sort of meta analysis that basically aggregates and amalgamates the results from several studies and gives you an overall estimate for your studies. Also, in the context of replication, you can promote this. Uh, convenient samples are also, uh, yeah, so basically, volunteer samples are also convenient samples, which basically self-selected sample. So where a participant chose to be part of that study. One of those uh, examples that Ronan Heinz gives is crowdsourcing. So basically where you, you shoot out an email blast to 100,000 people and you say, okay, here's my question here, whoever wants to answer, please answer. And then you see whatever comes back and you utilize this data. Obviously that's a 
convenience and breakfast crowds was they basically involve the crowd to answer specific question. It's just one of the examples, but it becomes increasingly powerful if you use crowd sourcing because we live in a time of absolute information and absolute communication. So uh, this is being increasingly utilized. Also in the context of online network sampling, sort of any turf, like the mechanic turf. I don't know who of you is familiar with that. That's an Amazon service where you can earn money by minuscule amount of money to complete questionnaires to give in, in inputs to do different tasks and, uh, online. And this is what M2. So again, if you get questionnaire data that is collected by that way, absolute convenience that is likely not represented. So this is to be kept in mind whenever you uh, come to read a paper, always understand the sampling approach the authors have used. This really makes a tremendous difference. The same issue with convenience sampling and biases, you also have the testimonial. So I don't know about you, but I read the reviews before I purchase something, particularly if it's of a larger cost. The problem with reviews is there's a reason that people wrote that, right? So either they're super satisfied with the product or they really hate it. But what you really want to know, you want to have those 150,000 people who bought the product and like, they're okay with it, it does the job, but they're not over the moon and they're also not dissatisfied. So this is the problem with testimonials. You only get those extreme moments. Um, yeah. So I'm not gonna go too deep into nail polish, that's not my expertise, but yeah, so this is uh, the example that Norman and Heinz not describing, also in the book. Random assignment. Any questions to that so far? I think it's fairly easy, right? And we will really, we will, uh, we will look into a set test uh, and comparing these sample means to population means in chapter nine, chapter eight. And that's when we actually do this formal testing. And this essentially will, you will think of generalizability, but we make reference to that because this is really how you can formally test it. So uh, random assignment means to minimize confounding. And we talked about this in the first, uh, when we talked about the first chapter, I think it was the second module. We have uh, health behavior and participation in the wellness program. And we have two scenarios. We have one scenario where the individual could choose him or herself to be part of the wellness program. And this would obviously create a bias because the individual choosing to be in a wellness program is somebody who's more interested in it and likely has a greater interest in health behavior and how to change behavior, health and healthy behavior. This creates a bias. This creates confounding. Problem uh, can be overcome by randomization. You basically you involve a group of people and you ask a group of people, do you want to participate in my study? And then once they have consented, like the consent form, which you will find out what that is, basically it's, it's, it's follows a certain outline if you consent to participate in the study. Once they consented, then you randomly assign them to either become part of the intervention group or of the control group. And they the intervention group, they're becoming part of the wellness program. And if not, then they're not. Then essentially down the road, after some time, you observe the difference between those groups and you basically you get an idea how effective is my wellness program. So with random selection, you minimize the confounder that is given by the health behavior at the beginning, because if they're randomly balanced between both groups and randomly assigned, this uh, health behavior should be balanced at the start of the study. Therefore, you get a true estimate of how effective is that wellness program. Any questions on that? Randomization, I think we talked about this earlier. Right? Probability. So probability is really a concept that is very central in forensic statistics because it basically allows you 
to draw conclusions from your sample and extrapolate them to a general population. And this is essentially something that we will do uh, with hypothesis testing, where you basically you detect differences and you ascertain with a certain probability whether this difference is just an error or pure chance, or whether this is really what we call in statistics a significant difference. And this is where probability will be very central. Uh, I, I assume that all of you had uh, probability in, in your earlier uh, education and you learned about this in high school. So we are not gonna go too deep into probabilities and um, it will be to some extent though assumed that you know the basics of it. So personal bias is what the confirmation bias where basically you enter uh, your conclusion, your decision making or your conclusion making with uh, a preconceived notion where basically you have already an idea and then you see an event occurring and this just basically confirms your um, formal belief. Um, and you basically assume that the probability you assumed was actually correct, while it may not be. So there's a confirmatory bias that you basically, you're looking at things differently when you thought always they would exactly be that way. So that's, that's what the confirmation bias is. Illusionary correlations, that's, a good example is the, the gambler's fallacy, for example. Uh, so when you're in Las Vegas on the roulette table, so basically you have uh, screens which shows what, what the last 20 numbers were. And the gambler may assume that if it was four times red in a row, that now it has to be black. So this is an absolute fallacy and an erroneous thing. Then we have in the context of probability, there's also subjective probability. Subjective probability is probabilities that are being made up, quote unquote. So it's, it's probability that is basically not existent. And it reminds me of a friend of mine told me uh, that 95% of all probabilities are made up on the spot. <laughs> That's kind of sometimes true, but this is basically a subjective probability that is not. It's more anecdotal, more not to be uh, considered um, to be an accurate estimate. When it becomes an accurate estimate, this is uh, when you look at expected relative frequency probability. This is the outcome of so called Bernoulli trials, where you basically you have a binary outcome, which is either zero or one. So it's a success or a failure. An example for that would be, for example, when you uh, look at the population of New York City and you say, okay, so I, I sample now 100 individuals. And I, I look out of these 100 individuals, I, I, I sample randomly individuals out, and I find a certain probability out of 100 people, let's assume we have 40% uh, diabetes. And you get 10 out of your 100 people, you have a 40% probability that you will randomly pick a diabetic. That's probability is 100%. So if I uh, would like to understand now the prevalence, which is the percentage of the population is called the prevalence, it's like an epidemiology term. If I want to understand this now for the entire city of New York, and I'm doing this for 100 people. I know 40 of them have diabetes. And I start to repeat my exercise now with a second independent sample. I can sample out another 100 people. And I get an estimate of 37. And I do it again with the third sample, I get 42. So essentially what it comes down to, and this is where the law of large numbers comes into play, that, uh, the larger the number. So if I have a sample of 100, and I'm, I'm drawing uh, all six, six different samples, I get six different estimates. The more often I repeat this exercise, the, the larger my number of trials get, the larger the number of samples the sample participants get. 
the more accurate this number with respect to the action in those populations. That means that essentially when you look at this, you can treat this as a continuous variety. You can say that if I do hundred of these samples of hundred, I get hundred data entries. I can make a histogram of that. And that's the beauty. And this is the law of large numbers because if you increase that sample size, if you have more and more samples, you get a distribution that actually gets close to a normal distribution. And based on that, you can basically say that the mean of all these samples will basically be the true population mean. That is kind of the idea that is meant with the expected relative frequency probability. So trial outcome success, and you have a law of large numbers. And we will talk about this. We will talk about this in the context of uh, normal approximation at a later point. So you basically can, uh, you can treat percentages and counts to some extent like a normal distribution because you basically you can calculate the variability around an estimate of a percentage in the same fashion as uh, we're doing it with the normal distribution of continuous data. So, so is this somewhat here, or are there any questions for that? I think it really, I think with the law of large numbers is the more trials, and the more samples, the more likely you will get an estimate that is close to the true mean or true proportion probability. Good, uh, calculating probability, we know that. Uh, so this is probability is calculated by successes over trials. If you roll a die, and you want to roll a six, your probability to roll a six is one in six. If you have three sixes in a row, and you roll it for the fourth time, your probability to roll six for this fourth time is how large? One. Yeah, it's still one over six. So it's mutually exclusive in the kingdom thing, and you will, for each time, you calculate it exactly the same fashion and you multiply those probabilities up, getting you to the overall probability. Um, confidence. It's the personal probability or the, the rating of our confidence that the event will occur. We will hear about confidence in the context of the confidence interval, which essentially will come at a later point. So it's basically for the confidence interval, we're trying to capture an interval that allows us to capture the true population mean. And we will do that with 95% certainty, which gets us to the next topic of inferential statistics, where we're basically using those rules of probability to test hypotheses. And these hypotheses, so they are probabilistic models that are being used to actually calculate the probability of individual but we will also use probability to test the probability that a so-called null hypothesis is, is, is actually correct or not correct. So under a null hypothesis, and now let's go back to generalizability. If you have a sample mean and you have a population, if you want to know whether your sample mean is significantly different from the population, you will compare them with a set test. Right. You would first make a null hypothesis, hypothesizing that these two means are not different. And you will test this null hypothesis to either reject or accept this null hypothesis. If you reject the null hypothesis that there's no difference, and the probability for this action to be true is smaller than 5%, you will accept the research hypothesis. This is a concept that we will discuss ad nauseatum once we get to have all success. So you will hear that again. Just keep in mind, no different hypothesis, different research or empirical hypothesis. We talk about troops, we talk about control troops and experimental troops, wellness program, no wellness program. Basically, this is the assignment that was randomly assigned in a randomized control trial. 
making a decision is rejecting or failing to reject the null hypothesis. This will follow a so-called, uh, yes, okay, we're not talking about this yet. So basically null hypothesis is no difference, no change of the difference, is such a this difference. You basically, if you accept null hypothesis, you're failing to reject null hypothesis. If you accept the research hypothesis, you are rejecting the null hypothesis. You do this at a certain acceptable uh, uh, risk of an error. You have a risk of an error, which is called the presence of probability, that you are rejecting something you shouldn't have rejected. Which is a so called type one error. And this type one error is defined with what is called alpha, which is an acceptable type one error. You need to get this, your quantified probability of this being a type one error when you see this difference uh, below this threshold. That's what you need to also. A type two error, which is the worst type case. Or you fail to reject the null hypothesis, or where you should have rejected it. Far more problem with that is, for example, if you study two mutations, if you have a quote unquote underpowered study, where the statistical power was not strong enough for you to actually reject the null hypothesis. Any questions on that? Now, if we can talk about the small uh, shocking prevalence of type 1 error. So we will talk about this in different contexts when it comes to uh, p-values because we need to get the, the study under that acceptable threshold alpha. And, and points that no one has to make at one point is that a lot of studies are just a notch under that alpha. Kind of hinting that it could be that there's some beta massaging going on, that's a subsetting or some removal of outliers that basically helps to get that p value under that threshold so they make it actually a significant positive outcome and make it something that is easy to actually get published in the journal. Because whatever is significant is easy to publish. Good. So that's all I have. Any questions on anything of that? Makes us to count ifs and convert questions. I can stick around for another five to 10 minutes if there are more questions. But, uh, I wish you a nice break and we'll see you on 1024. For this one, have I tried to prevent the you know, to exist up in the soft page 22 because it's only stopping to let an older woman right? Overall, and can you take her off? That's me and Andrew. Shoot, for the whole group first. The whole group first. So what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to define the count for the whole group. And then for this. So I would do this minus the less than and greater than? Yeah, correct. So the count for overall should be identical with men and women independently. Uh, okay. And also, on my other question was, um, for this, why am I getting the error set? I did the same thing. I'm on Yeah, so that's that's just a warning that something may be off. Uh, but it's not. If it's not. if 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 you confirm it by counting the entries, um, if you just count it and you confirm your formula and you're confident about the formula, then you can disregard the error. Yeah, I copy and paste it. So it's good. But okay. um, I'm only doing for not for overall for 